Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Yates. I work at The Observer and live in the soft south. Though I do have northern credentials, I was born and raised in Liverpool. Uh, what's to be done about the north is an old, old question. But for a bunch of economic and political reasons, a greater desire for devolution among them, it's a question that now seems more urgent, more real, less rhetorical. So much so that the developing question is perhaps, what can the North do for itself? I'd like to introduce our panel. Sir Richard Lees, on my far left, has been leader of Manchester City Council since 1996. He oversaw the regeneration of the city following the IRA bomb of that year and is a central player in all discussions about a collective northern economic powerhouse. <coughs> Luke Cordwell, on my near left, is the CEO of Magnetic North, a digital design company based in Manchester. She was formerly head of business development at JWT and has won lots of awards, including the Institute of Directors Young Director of the Year. It's a long time ago. <laughs> Carolyn Norbury, on my immediate right, is the CEO of Creative England, which champions and invests in creative talent and business across film, TV, games and digital media. She is also a member of the UK's Creative Industries Council. Professor David Crow is the Dean of Manchester Art School and Pro Vice Chancellor of Manchester Metropolitan University. Before academia, David was a successful graphic designer working for clients as diverse as the Rolling Stones and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Okay, our first question is from Malcolm <coughs> Garrett, who's the master of the Royal Designers and co-curator of Design <coughs> Manchester. Malcolm, please. Uh, it, this evening, I just wonder, are we talking about a North versus London, or are we talking about the regions, loathsome term, versus <coughs> London, or is it something else? Richard, could you begin? Uh, it's certainly not the North versus London. Uh, just as the North needs uh, a successful Manchester and other successful cities, the UK needs a successful uh, London as well. And really to get into a debate about uh, just moving the deck chairs around is not where we, where we want to be. Uh, I think the real debate is that within the UK, uh, economically, the North of England and uh, I, th I think there is a real danger that the north of England is becoming homogenised at the mo a moment as if it was one place, the nor north of England, but I'll, I'll still use the north of England, and its major cities have been underperforming. They've certainly been underperforming uh, in comparison with the best performing cities in, uh, in, in Europe, and uh, I think there is a very, stru well, very strong argument that if uh, northern cities had far greater control over their own destiny, they would perform uh, a lot, lot better. And I think it's also a very strong argument, given the distances between uh, our major northern cities, that although maintaining their distinctiveness is very, very important, that if uh, travel links between those cities uh, were uh, 21st century rather than still being uh, uh, 19th century, uh, that uh, we will be, then be able to get the benefits of agglomeration. And what that means in shorthand is effectively uh, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield and places around can share a labour market and I think that would have a, a, a remarkably positive impact on our economic destiny. Uh, Lou? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I, one thing I'd um, echo from what Richard's saying is I think the... Um, there is a risk that we lose our kind of city identity if was too much of the debate is a, a collective, um, occasionally slightly patronising, lumping together of all of the northern cities into one big, one big homogenous mess. So I think, um, and, and the other thing I think is to twist the conversation to be a positive one, which is I don't think the debate is versus London at all. I think the, ten years ago when we were having pockets of devolution debate, that was the tone of the conversation. The tone to me now is, let's accept London has kind of floated onto a stratosphere that is on a par with New York and Hong Kong and cities that um, we can't compete with. So the debate is really about the rest of the UK, I think, and that's, that's a positive debate to be having. And without doubt, most of the northern cities that we engage on a daily basis accept that whilst we need our own identity, there are things collectively we can do together because there is critical mass and there are shared skills and there is a, an interesting narrative there, but we just need to be careful not to be 
the north because yeah, I yeah, think no, that's no, kind well, of convenient well, for London. Well, I wonder about, about this idea of collaboration because in the 19th century, weren't the great northern cities often vying with each other? Yes. It was as much yeah. about competition. Yeah, and, and I think some, sometimes that competition is healthy, isn't it? Because yeah. you do want to have a distinctiveness and a, a competition to, to spur the whole of the north on, but, um, but yeah. Caroline is, is something of an outsider, perhaps. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Sorry? Outside of the north, I mean. Okay, all right. Um, so, I think that, um, I think part of the, of the problem with the, with, the, with, the, with the sort of the whole uh, London versus north debate comes through a sort of a dysfunction generally in the way that we've organised our politics and our, um, you know, and everything really, I suppose since in terms of that if all money and power is concentrated in London then what happens is that you have a debate which is about those people who don't have it queuing up and competing with each other for the attention of London and that completely skews actually what what it is that I think that that that, that one needs to do if one is to have a healthy um, UK wide economy so it shouldn't really be about about London versus everything else and one of the things I think is happening is that this idea of the north um, is, is not about so much the north, it's almost, it's almost being used as a negative, as an other, meaning not the south, yeah, yeah. actually, um, yeah. meaning not where the power is. Um, and so I think, that, I think that, you know, as Lou says, London is an international city, and what is interesting about it, actually, is that, um, is that if you look at somewhere like Silicon Roundabout, um, and you look at all of those, all of those new really sexy creative tech businesses, most of those tech businesses are actually led by um, people from overseas mm. who come over here and who benefit from our fabulous education system. Mm. Um, they build businesses in London and then they're bought and they move to LA um, or to Silicon Valley or somewhere. And so I think that, I think that, that, that it's a much wider debate other, rather about, not just about London versus the rest of the country. It's much more about how do we have um, a much more transparent, a much more equitable sharing of power and money so that um, the best decisions can be made for the benefit of, of everybody. Because from my perspective, the best decisions, I think, are made by, by people who are close to the impact of those decisions mm. and who understand what the long-term outcomes of those decisions are going to be made. And I think what we're seeing in this sort of this sort of binary discussion is a sense that a lot of people, rightly, um, don't feel that they have got any purchase over those decisions yeah. and any purchase over that, you know, mm. the, the, the money that can actually do something about those decisions. So lots of the northern questions could equally apply to somewhere like Bristol? Uh, yes, I mean, Bristol is... Um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, one of, I've, I've worked in Bristol for a long, long time, and, and, and there is a real sense in, in, in Bristol um, of, uh, of being completely marginalised because it doesn't belong to a north or yeah, anything, yeah. really. Yeah. It's very, very out on, it, on so its limbs. So it loses out in two ways. But, but, but trying, to, trying to sort of characterise London and the rest of the, of the country as, as, you know, two very specific things is quite difficult because, you know, all of this conversation about... Uh, devolution. Your, the experience of Norwich um, is very different from the experience of Bristol, which is very different from the experience of, of Manchester and, and the experience of, of Leeds or Sheffield. So I think we need to, I know it's, we need to introduce a little bit more of uh, a sensitivity, I suppose, into, 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 in, into those, um, yeah, into the specifics of those particular cities and what they need to, to, to thrive. David? Well, I agree, it's certainly not about the North versus London, it's perhaps the North as well as London, or cities in the North as well as London as an alternative. Um, in this school here, about 40% of the students come from homes which are more than 100 miles away, mm -hmm. so we pull people into the city. We also have this university, has lots of international students here, so it's about providing a place where we can start to spread the talent across the country. Do they, and do the they economic. tend to stay, those? Some do, but there is still um, a bit of a drift back to London afterwards in the creative industries. And that, that's an issue that's probably there because of the funding that are, that's around that and the, there's a kind of habit in the industry um, to, to, you know, for the work to stay in London. And we work very hard at trying to make sure 
That's why we're here, to try and make sure that those, some of that talent stays in the region and provides an alternative. And actually the north, all of the northern cities, I'm sure, are full of people who, who went to London and had some career there. I, I myself had a bit of a career in London and then came back to the north for a reason, you know, for a lifestyle change or, or, or there were things in London they didn't like. So, it, no, I don't think it's the north versus London. I think it's the north as well as London. We, I think the UK needs other economic bases to make the UK strong rather than one in London. Great. Um, before throwing it open, I'd like uh, John Mathers, who's the Chief Executive of the Design Council, obviously a big player in this debate, to say a few words. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, it's John Mathers, actually. So Sorry. Just a nuance. But, um, uh, uh, first thing I'd like to say is um, I'm not quite sure I understand this debate at all because I come from Inverness, and that's the true north. <laughs> and we're sort of only halfway there, really, when, in Manchester. So this, this is the British Midlands, actually. <laughs> Something like that. And we're, Scotland is still part of the UK, which is, which is great. Um, yes, I, I'm, I run the Design Council, and the Design Council is a national brand. And um, I'm very lucky that, um, first of all, I travel quite a lot, and uh, I also have a lot of people who come to visit us at the Design Council in uh, in our offices, and they come to us because um, because they see Britain as a cultural, a creative and cultural centre and a and a powerhouse. They don't come to us because they see London as a um, as a powerhouse. And I think that's really important and something that we mustn't uh, mustn't forget. I'm lucky. I sit on the same uh, council that Caroline sits on, the Creative Industries Council, and um, and the debate today is actually about the role of the creative industries in building a northern powerhouse, and I don't think we need to remember that. Um, there's some fantastic evidence being published this year about the, um, the strength and size and growth of the creative industries. The creative industries in the UK are now as big um, as the financial services sector. It, it, the creative industries are growing faster than any other sector in the UK, and it's creating more jobs in the UK than any other sector. So um, there's a, a real um, wakening up to the power of the creative industries and the role it can play in helping to regenerate cities, and we mustn't forget that. Um, so um, I think we've got to continue to think about um, Great Britain brand, uh, that's really important. But I also, um, I mean, I totally endorse the view that there are um, opportunities to bolster local creative hubs. And um, there, there's been some really good um, research done in a place called Brighton, which is in the south. Um, there's, we're just about kicking off a, a similar sort of um, thing called the, the Bristol and Bath views, which is happening next week. And there's also going to be a, a one um, uh, undertaken in the northeast, uh, which is Newcastle sort of area, with the five universities around there in the spring of next year. And that's looking at how the ecosystem of the creative industries works with, um, within the in infrastructure as a whole and bolsters um, uh, industry as a whole. And I think um, there's going to be some really interesting evidence that could actually inform uh, the debate here if we have a similar debate in a year's time. Um, one thing I feel passionately about, and David has sort of alluded it to it earlier on, and I've spoken here passionately about it in the past, is I think it's absolutely wrong that um, what you were talking about happens, that um, students come from um, the south, come to Manchester, and then do their degree and then disappear off back to London. Um, I think that uh, industry and universities should be collaborating much more effectively to actually ensure that, um, that, that people stay in the towns in which they study. And I think a lot of universities, and, and David and I again have talked about this, a lot of universities have um, employability targets. My view is they should have employability targets in the local community in which they've studied. Um, and let's see whether we can make that happen. So, um, how do I feel? I, I think building a northern powerhouse is absolutely right, and the creative industries can, can help to do that. But don't forget that there's a, a bigger ecosystem. Um, uh, and David, you may, you're probably going to correct me. I think there are 65,000 students come out of design courses in the UK every year. I, I won't, I won't okay. challenge you on that. 65,000 right. um, 65, mm -hmm. students come out of design courses in the UK every year. A million students come out of design courses in China every year. China is on a, a mission to talk about being made in China and moving from made in China to designed in China. 
They don't talk about being designed in Shenzhen or some other regional city. They talk about the, um, the, the country as a whole, and that's the way I think we should think. Great. Can I, can I ch sure. just kind of challenge something, really? About, uh, it's really about what happens to uh, uh, students that come to Manchester and then what happens to them once they, uh, uh, once, once they graduate. And uh, I think two things. For probably about a decade now, Manchester has been a net importer of graduates rather than an exporter of, uh, of, uh, of graduates. So uh, we're not actually producing enough graduates ourselves to meet our demand within the city. So that's people coming from uh, elsewhere. But it's also, the, the way the world works requires a, an interactivity between cities around the world. And for that to work effectively, we need some of the people who graduate in Manchester to go back to where they came from, or Manchester graduates, to go to other parts of the world in order to create that, uh, to create that interaction. So the fact, I think, uh, uh, MMU can talk about being in contact with something like 125,000 of its alumni all over the world is part of how we build Manchester's place within, uh, within the world. It's all about uh, balance, really. At the moment, I think Manchester's in a quite good place uh, for, for balance because we're importing more than we're exporting. But we do need to export some, and we need to export some of the good ones as well. Are there any questions, please, on this particular question, which was, are we talking about North versus London, regions versus London, or something else? Any hands? Don't be shy. <coughs> Uh, the woman in red, please, towards the back. Hello there. Um, speaking as a scouser who currently works in London and lives in Lancashire, it's complicated, don't ask. Um, I think this, that's the wrong question. The question isn't the North versus anything. It should be the North and the rest of the world. Don't get distracted by any kind of fight. Don't waste your effort. It's about being open and inclusive, which is what great cities like Liverpool and Manchester have always done. So shouldn't that be the focus instead? Does anybody want to pick up on that? I think you've made your point very well. Yeah, good. Anybody else? Down the front, please. I just wanted to build a bit on what the lady in red said. I didn't see her, but uh, the lady in red. Only ladies in red will get Only questions tonight. Only ladies in red. <laughs> um, I certainly, I was here last week for one day only, for one night only. Um, but uh, I was at the conference and David told me before the conference, David Crow told me before the conference that he got a Brazilian delegation over. And I think that, and it was, there are links being formed with Brazil and a university in California um, through creative industries, creative work. Now to me that shows the sort of openness that I would expect of somebody like Manchester. It's not that closed oh, we're Manchester, we're better, or we're the North, we're better. It's actually reaching out. So it's evidence of backing up what the lady just said, that that is going on, and David might want to explain a bit more about those links. But I also, adding onto it, and I will give the mic back in a minute, um, links with places like South America, other places, not necessarily going to link with London, not necessarily, not in every case, mm. Maybe that is something that's happening more here, and that's how the North and the country gets its strength. I was born in the North, for what it's worth, but I live in London. Great. David, did you want to explain? Um, I'll try and briefly explain. Yes, we had a, a, a group of creative industries related um, delegates here last week. They're interested in Manchester, I think, because, well, at least partly, because this used to be a big manufacturing area and they can recognize in, even from that distance that the area has reinvented itself and the creative industries have been at the core of that and they know that they need to do the same thing they are competing with china and india and in manufacturing they find it difficult to compete on price so they need to compete on design and on knowledge so they want to know what happened in this region so they want to come and have a look here and and actually and this isn't about the manchester versus north it's just something that, they said that one of the things they want to do is bring some artists to, to England to spend a brief time here. And they just felt they would just get a bit lost in the noise in London, really. That actually they could join a community here and it could be meaningful, whereas, you know, a couple of months in London, nobody would probably even notice they were there. So the size can actually be an the, advantage. The, the size and the compact nature of the city and the interconnected nature of what was here, they were very impressed with, yeah. Um, Malcolm, you asked the question, would... Uh 
Well, obviously, it was a very uh, provocative question, and, and uh, the answers I, I've been hearing are extremely reassuring. You know, I've been thinking it's not uh, uh, us versus them. It should be very much us and us. You know, I'm, I'm interested in a, in a connected UK that, put, but that put forward, puts forward a, a, a kind of united front. Uh, uh, and, and as David says, Manchester has a great advantage in that it's very compact and contained and can be a genuine platform that brings together both the design professions from across the UK but can have then have, have a dialogue uh, uh, internationally. Great. Lovely. I'd like to move on to our next question, please. This is from Chris Borkin. Chris, put up his or her hand. Chris, is over there. Okay, so Chris is the head of creative at JD Sports. Is there a skills and quality gap that has to be addressed if we want to fulfil the potential of the North? Did you all hear? No. Okay. Uh, again? Chris asked, is there a skills and quality gap that has to be addressed if we want to fulfil the potential of the North? Uh, Lou, can you begin with that one? I, I, think, I don't think, again, this is a particularly Northern thing. Everybody I meet nationally and internationally is battling with the same issue, which is if you work in creative and particularly digital slash tech, everybody wants to run faster than you can find good people. So everybody's fighting largely for the same pool, whether that's trying to drag people to and from London or uh, on a plane from China. It doesn't really um, seem to be a, a particularly kind of regional issue. I think, I think the issue is, or the opportunity is, we've got a sector that's in massive growth. Mm -hmm. Um, that investors are enormously interested in and that um, the talent supply uh, can't meet the demand. So, so I think, um, I, th I guess the, the promising news is that uh, uh, lots of very intelligent people seem to be highly engaged with this agenda and I, I don't think it's been ignored and I think there are lots of incredibly um, impressive initiatives that are addressing uh, the needs of future employers. So whilst we might feel a little bit of Could that pain Could you give an, now, an example of a good Well, I think apprentice. you see lots of amazing apprenticeship schemes. So you see everything from people like the BBC running their apprenticeship schemes, either here or in London or, you know, in, in Glasgow. Um, you see, um, you know, some government-led initiatives. You see some engagement of 16 to 24-year-old talent. You see some of the new colleges that are emerging, so like Oldham College, where they're recognising that lots of people want to work in the media sector or the creative and digital, they don't necessarily know what that means. And they are actively working hand in hand with employers to say, well, can you help us shape this course and understand what you're going to need in two or three years' time? So, so I think there are lots of people, um, possibly too many people on, on some days, kind of engaged in that skills agenda. But um, we have, uh, I think it's less of people running to and from London, um, more that just generally, wherever you turn up, you can't get enough people to do the job. And is Britain behind? Britain overall? <coughs> it's less of a north-south thing, is Britain uh, losing out? Generally, I think some of the stuff we talked about before, um, about there is a demand for British design um, and creative talent at the moment, which is causing a problem. Some of the really bright people um, that, that we know are not really having a debate like, is it Manchester versus London? They're saying, well, I've been offered this job. Um, you know, working for Google and it's an international position and I'm going to get all these amazing perks and I'm going to, and you're trying to kind of then persuade them to come and work for an SME in the Northern Quarter that doesn't have any of those perks and isn't Google, you know. So I think, I think there is a, the positive of Brand UK riding high is there are lots of people who want to engage and invest. The negative is everybody wants the next Johnny Ives, you know. So I think that's the, that's, that's the conundrum we've got to deal with and, and um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, China are, are in that race now and, and doing it at scale. Doing it at scale and at quality, that's the challenge. It's easy to do it at scale, but what you can quickly do is erode Brand UK. If we start to output lots of people who aren't actually that very good, they start to get a place at Google and people go, actually, forget that, we're going to turn to Denmark because that's where the next kind of wave of really interesting designs is coming from. Carolyn? Um, I think specifically there is a, there is a, a problem in terms of... Um, coding, for example, and coders. And if you think about growth in this country, the majority of that growth, particularly within the creative industries, is, is digital and, and our economy. We are the most digitally enabled economy in the world. And yet we do suffer you know, extremely from a lack of, of skills on, on that side. Um, I also think there's a bit of a disconnect between um, the sort of conversation that we're having and that I have with, with businesses a lot and actually what's happening at a policy level, which is that um, employers are saying that what they need is well-rounded um, 
you know, uh, interactive, intellectually curious students. Um, and we're having, dis you know, there are discussions in the broadsheets about, in, you know, introducing Latin into the curriculum and so on. And that it feels to me that there is, there's a real disconnect there. Um, I think it's going to take, despite all the, you know, the, the, the um, computing or is now on the national curriculum, yeah. um, but there's going to be a real time lag, actually, in terms of a helping teachers to to teach, learn to how to teach it, and recruiting those teachers, and then putting that in place. So you would a, like more emphasis on practical skills. You think well, Latin is a wee too bit abstract, perhaps? Um, oh, well, personally, I do, but you know, I'm not an educationist. I'm just a mum, really, um, and, and an employer. Um, but I also think that I think that there, I think we have, I think we're facing a massive threat. Um, because whilst I'm saying all this about the need for tech skills, and we absolutely need them, you see the, the impact, of, and, that, and that, that, that narrative ha has got a lot of purchase, and a lot of things are happening because of it. But the downside of that is that you see a real reduction in terms of funding for arts courses mm -hmm. and recruitment for, um, you know, the, in terms of universities being able to recruit um, for their arts and design courses. You see arts organisations being cut. You see arts organisations bending over backwards to talk about the economic impact of what they're doing rather than actually talking about what it is, you know, actually the, the real thing that they're doing. Um, and the thing that this country is built on or the, that our creative industries are built on is that originality, that voice, that ability to create something from nothing. Um, and that is partly because we have amazing art schools. You know, we have a really, we have the best system in the world of private and public institutions and small companies and people who make stuff happen. Um, and, and a lot of that is threatened by having this binary conversation again about tech versus, crea uh, versus art. Um, and I think, again, you know, one needs, one needs to introduce a bit more balance. Um, and and I, think, I think the arts are just as important. Yeah. Um, well, as, we could as turn to a man in the middle of this debate, yes. uh, David, please. <laughs> well, how fantastic to hear you say that. I know there's lots of people from education out here who will be really pleased to hear you say what you've just said. Th this question usually comes down to the digital area, and, and I sort of thought this would happen. The creative industries is huge, um, you know, it's, and, we, and in this school we have from one end of the spectrum to the other, but really the, the skills debate tends to be about the digital stuff that's so moving faster than we can. And I hold my hands up and say that is an issue for us. All of us in education understand that's an issue. And there are, there are digital skills that need to be introduced into things, in, into a system that actually moves slower than the industry. And that, that is an issue. So that sort of points to perhaps a need for us to build new models around that so that we can do things slightly differently. The other skills gap that gets talked about, which is real, which is a bit easier to deal with, which is the sort of softer skills, entrepreneurship, leadership, that type of stuff, and I think teamwork was mentioned, um, and I think most art schools, which I agree are fantastic British art schools, are dealing with that in their own way, so I, th I think we're, we're dealing with that one. Um, well-rounded, yes, I think they do need to be well-rounded, and, and we mentioned before we had a delegation over. People come here, we've got Chinese delegation coming next week, we've got people going to China next week, because in that drive to design in China, they look to the UK for the clues and you know Glasgow School of Art and many others have got bases in Singapore for three years because they want to know how to do British art and design as well. Mm -hmm. So we mustn't undervalue that. It's really very valuable that we have a very rounded experience and, and at the core of the creative industries is the arts and if we don't have that the rest of it isn't going to flourish at all. Brilliant. So Richard what can politicians do about this? Well, I, I, I guess I'm going to question, question the notion of uh, uh, wanting lots of well-rounded uh, people, really. It sounds incredibly boring to me if everybody's uh, well-rounded. We actually need people with a bit you of... You want edges. Uh, yeah, edges, quirks and uh, differences, uh, uh, really. I do agree with what said about the role of uh, arts and culture. Uh, within in this, although I know that this university, for example, is still doing uh, uh, remarkably well in recruiting to arts and humanities uh, uh, courses, notwithstanding uh, the way the finance works. And as a city, we are clearly uh, we're investing uh, in arts and culture uh, next year, as well as the fifth uh, Manchester International Festival home opens. Uh, with Art Gallery, uh, Extend and Refurbish opens. And again, just around the corner from here, uh, MMU is planning a massive investment in Mabel Tilcott, its 
uh, theatre complex there and will continue to invest in the infrastructure to support the arts. So in this city it's going to continue to grow. All of which of course has nothing to do with, really with the question you asked about uh, uh, skills and skilled, skilled labour. But it actually says it's a mixed picture. Uh, I think digital skills are, are, are an issue in, in a, a city like Manchester and other parts of the uh, creative industries because of the quality of the, the teaching institutions uh, we have, that we are producing uh, a, a very large number of very highly skilled uh, people. A lot of them are staying, as I said earlier, staying, staying in the city, uh, starting their own businesses, working uh, for, for companies within, within the city, uh, but we do at the same time have uh, skilled at skill shortages. The, how we, we, we meet those and certainly what's going on with our schools and colleges now, really very, very exciting stuff including in, in digital, the growth of code clubs for, uh, for example means that we're going to have a whole, whole range of, uh, uh, of young people who grow up with a completely different mindset to uh, uh, certainly any digitally based in industry and digital is a tool within indus industry as well but there are, there are uh, short term problems and uh, two things we need uh, there, first of all um, current government policy around uh, uh, migrant labour uh, is, is really killing any attempt to be able to meet short and medium term ne needs in what are very highly mobile workforces. These are workforces, if they can't move around for work uh, here, they'll just go, so, uh, just go so, uh, somewhere else. And uh, we need to have far, far greater flexibility in being able to attract the best labour from wherever it is in, in, in the world and for them to be able to uh, come here. So uh, we need to really, I think, attack the sort of uh, inward looking uh, sort of approach of the Daily Mail to, uh, uh, to immigrant labour and actually say that the uh, UK is a country, Manchester is city is open for business for people who want to come and uh, come and work here and I, I think we need to just hammer away at that uh, uh, message before we uh, not only become a, uh, a cut off island we'll become a very poor island and a very culturally poor island as a consequence uh, to that. The last thing to say, to say is in terms of skills uh, that there are big issues about non-graduate uh, uh, skills and we have an adult skills system which is completely centralised, it's run out of Coventry, I've got nothing against Coventry, I lived there for nine, uh, nine, nine years, but people sat in Coventry don't know what the skill needs are in Leeds or Manchester or, or anywhere else and it is probably the single most important part of the uh, devolution argument is that uh, what uh, skills provision exists in this city ought to be determined in this city, not f far, far away, so that we can basically uh, make sure that publicly funded skills provision within Manchester relates to the economic needs of this city. Five minutes. Any questions on this theme, please? Uh, okay, quite a few at the back there. Um, blonde woman, just before the divide. <laughs> Not Next to the woman in red. <laughs> Next to the woman in red. Yeah. Um, basically, I was about to say that we have an incredible amount of students or sort of non-students that have the digital skills. We actually run a digital apprenticeship. Those students wouldn't fit within the university mod uh, sort of model, and. I think they're the ones that we could be looking at because they're young, they're sort of really creative, but they might actually be overlooked if they're not sort of nurtured and put into the right places. We also run the digital media management course. That's actually sort of more international, so we're bringing students in. I would say a lot of them actually go back out again, but they're also bringing in a lot of their friends, they're bringing in a lot of attention to Manchester in the north. They literally every weekend they'll go to Scotland, they'll go to the lakes, so they travel around a lot and they sort of like talk about Manchester and the North. So um, we sort of keep dwelling on students that they're going to bring in that digital knowledge. It might be the apprenticeship schemes that we should be sort of talking about and looking into. Okay, sorry, were you asking a question? You, you, you would like to see more apprenticeships? Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm going to just take this microphone right now. So it's Maria Stukov. I work for Sony Computer Entertainment Europe PlayStation. I am one of, one of the biggest advocates for Manchester. I've lived here 16 years. I'm from Australia. I graduated from MMU with a PhD in art and design, but also Salford. 
Now, as an employer, hi, Eddie, is the problem. Now, if I have people coming here from Japan, from America, from Asia, and they're coming to Manchester, <coughs> it's like, where the fuck are they going? Are they going to BBC Salford? Are they going to Sharp Project? Are they going to the Northern Project? When they arrive here, it takes actually quite a long time to explain which venue or which cluster they're meant to actually go to. And I really like to echo what Lou was saying is that actually some of this debate needs to actually be looked at in terms of Manchester and what we have here already, but actually solve some of our own problems. We have so much diverse projects going on, like Hyper Island. We, have, we support things like with the, the Oldham Careers College. We've got great stuff going on, but it's so disconnected. Everything is all over the place. There's not one point I can signpost anyone coming in from Singapore who have amazing skill sets to go, look, come to Manchester. Can Where I, to? Can Where I put to? this to the man on my, on my left? We, so, Richard, you need more coherence in the city. Uh, well, ooh. Uh, oh, I, 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 I'm going to hand over to Lou in a bit, because uh, well, no, there is a very practical reason that Lou has been doing a lot of work over the uh, last year or so, uh, particularly around digital industries as a section of creative industries, about how we do have a coherent uh, narrative uh, for Manchester that we can project on a, an international stage. And uh, I think that's, that's a, a, a real issue, is, is that... Uh, uh, until relatively recently, in a whole range of areas, not just creative industries, uh, that Manchester is very bad, being very bad at knowing what story it is that it should be uh, should be telling. Uh, but I think there's a lot of work about that, uh, uh, of sorting sorting that out. And I, I think I phrased it about 18 months ago: is that Manchester got very good at, uh, at selling itself as fun Manchester, uh, but didn't have a clue about selling itself as serious Manchester. And we need to sell the serious side uh, as well. Having said that, the fact that people come from uh, Japan or Singapore or whatever else and there are half a dozen, a dozen or more different places that are relevant for them to see, I would see as an absolute positive rather than a, a, a negative. Uh, I want people to come to Manchester and not be able to see everything in 24 hours or 48 hours and to know that they have to come back for more because the place has so much uh, to offer. So that we, have, uh, that, that we have the Northern Quarter, that we have the uh, Media City, that we have the BBC, ITV, the Sharp Project, the Space, uh, uh, project, uh, the corridor, and so on, is actually uh, is part of the, the richness of what we have to offer. That I think is ultimately the the selling point. So yeah, we need to get the story right, but we have to remember it's a big story, not a small story. Lou, is there anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, my, uh, it's, uh, part of what I um, do uh, outside of my day job is is working on the Greater Manchester Let, which I joined about a year ago, and. <clears throat> got pounced upon within about 20 seconds everybody going narrative narrative we need to get the story of the city right and I think I think that's probably true for lots of cities all over the UK but I think one of the things that London as a, a kind of exemplar city in some ways has got right is it's very good at telling its story very succinctly it has people whether you love them or hate them like Boris who are figureheads that people can quickly um, in 20 seconds press the film and understand what you know the narrative of London um, as a city is so there is a piece of work that we've started about 12 months ago, which is there is a, there is a narrative issue generally, in my view, for the city as a whole, you know, yeah. as Rich alluded to, which is what we were known for or what we're known for in some international pockets is not necessarily what we want to be known mm -hmm. for. At least we're known, you know, so that's kind of, you know, <laughs> we might be known for football, but at least I'll take that as a, as a beginning calling card and then we need to twist what we're known for. Yeah. Um, have, you, but have you tried to come up with a sentence? We're, no, we're not. We're not a sentence yet. Okay. These things move like, very slowly. Like, so uh, a paragraph or a chapter. Well, I, I think I think what's you know so there's, so there's a narrative issue, but then if you take obviously my my sector is digital and tech, and what there's been a parallel piece of work that we've been looking at with that, which which what's very interesting about that, as as Marie is uh, alluding to, there is. What the positive is, we've got a lot of pieces of the jigsaw. So we're not in a position where you're going, what the hell are we going to talk about? Like, we've got nothing going on. You know, there is no talent. There are no students. There are no amazing opportunities, ventures. There is no BBC. There is no Sharp Project. We've got all these incredible things. Um, but uh, I think whereas some cities have an awful lot of hype and not a lot of substance, we've got a lot of substance and we just really crap at the hype. Um, which is bizarre because in many ways Manchester is, you know, is very good at, is, is known for its hype. But I think 
So really what we've got to get right is a bit, of that, a bit of that noise. And if we wait for every single piece of the jigsaw to be there, we'll wait 10, 20 years. So I think it's an acceptance that we're probably 60, 70% there. Let's just get on and tell that story because it's an incredibly compelling story. And, you know, David's visitors from you know, Brazil, last week there was a delegation from St. Petersburg, the week before we had a delegation from Denmark. When they come and they hear the story from people who are living and breathing in the city of... They're highly engaged yeah. and they're amazed at all these things that they've never even heard of are going on. So, so there is a, a task, I think, just to get on and do it, to be honest, is the conclusion that there are a lot of some other things we'd probably quite like to have. But the more noise we make, the more those things will probably quite naturally happen because more money will flood in and will help to make them happen. God, I, look, I look forward to that sentence. This, this week, Deputy Mayor of New York as well, so even big cities yeah. come and look at what we're doing here. Uh, Caroline, would like a quick just, one. I, just, I think, Lou, you're being slightly hard on yourself, um, really, because <laughs> I, think, I think people do know about... You know, that Manchester has got a real sense of itself. It has got a story. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it is very, very prevalent in popular culture. It is known for being, you know, independent and quirky and original. And so I think that, you know, I think... It, I, think I also think, actually, that the sort of... The, the, um, the statement about there not being, you know, one place to go <laughs> is also slightly unfair. I mean, you, you know, you, you go into... Into, into, into London, there's no one place. You know, there's like thousands of places. You go to New York, there's thousands of places and there's thousands of things to do and engage with and so on. It, you know, I've just, I was in, um, I was in uh, Malmo recently in, in Sweden and there is a creative cluster, there is one place. <laughs> You know, it's very interesting, but there is one place that is not that mm -hmm. texture and breadth and depth. And so um, maybe signposting might need to be be, be better, um, but I, I actually think that, that all of the, these things are, are real strengths, and they're also facets of a very, very creative set of people and a very entrepreneurial set of people. I, I was involved in setting up a, a, a sort of a cluster in Bristol a long, long time ago, and it was a media cluster, and it brought together all the big media players and the producers and the companies and there are there are a lot of them in Bristol but as soon as we got any sort of, of homogeneity somebody decided it wasn't quite representing their thing mm. and then like a little animation group came and then there was a then there was a games one and then the games one split because they were another group of developers who had a different sort of approach and so I just think it's sort of natural that people form storm you know go yeah. off somewhere else so we, we better <laughs> move on to the next question um uh, sorry, you wanted to add something? Hi, my name is Cindy Simmons and I represent the MPA, which is an association for the creative industries in Greater Manchester, not for profit. Um, this is all kind of what we talk about day in, day out with our members. They are incredibly frustrated that nobody can articulate what the creative message is from the city. So what, what's going to, you know, 12 months is too long, you know, we need to kind of get something out there. Very quickly, really. I would say it's creatively messy having listened to these guys here. It is creatively messy, but I think somebody needs to take charge of it, and you know that. This is obviously it, really engaging people. I'll take it. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Another another one quickly. Hello, I'm um, I'm rather apprehensive talking in this um, gathering as I, born, bred, educated, worked in London. Um, I've, but I've come tonight from London to try and find out what is it that Manchester has that we would really want to get to know and understand. Um, I, uh, I'm from the Royal College uh, and then Ravensbourne and we're really keen on trying to work and develop a kind of relationship with um, other, other cities. It's really important in the UK. But, so I thought well, I'll come this evening just to see what is that narrative that uh, Manchester can say and it has to be one that's distinctive and I think that's really important and I, I'm really interested in this debate and I'd really push that forward that if there's a coherent narrative, then things can happen. I'm not saying London's coherent, it's not. But in fact, it, you know, it does have a reputation which works for it very well. And, you know, and so I, you know, I spent time to come here this evening to try and understand what it is that Manchester has and to try and kind of you know, work with it. Okay. Do you mind if we move on? Because we'll, there's lots of questions to be asked. I'm from Sheffield. There is other places See, it's creatively messy tonight. There are, there are other, sorry, there are other places in the north apart from Manchester. I'd just like to clarify that. Okay, fair point. Sheffield. Could I please ask Lillian Barton to identify herself? 
Lillian is uh, at the Manchester Metropolitan University Business School. Hello, good evening. Um, my question is, what can industry, education and government do to make the region more attractive for emerging talent to stay and to attract talent from outside? Uh, David, please. What can we do? Um, well, I think lots of things we do already, actually. Uh, the, you know, being inside this university, I know that the university benefits a lot from help from the city council, actually. Um, and, and we have a lot of industrial partners too. So there's a sense of common, a common mission, actually. It's, perhaps I see it a bit clearer because I'm on the inside and it looks a bit more incoherent from outside, I accept that. I do think there are other things that we could do. I think we need to make it easier for artists to stay and live and work here. Um, I think it is easier than in many other parts of the UK, certainly than London. But whatever we can do to hold them here, the first two or three years, I think, are critical. When they leave, they need, they need support, not just cheap rent, but they need somebody to speak to. They need kind of people who've been through that. And probably, and, and I, I'll have to defer to people like Lou for this, the, the, there is a point, I think, then, maybe three or four years in, where they just don't know how to move forward. Um, and the university may be able to help, but also there may be people in the city who can help them move from being two people in a little studio at the back of the northern quarter to something that could actually take on a wider spectrum of work. So I think it's two stages. The first few years, make it easy for them to stay, and they might not, you know, Richard's right, a lot of them do already stay, but some of our very talented students do go to London I think we can make that easier. Is that for work reasons? It's for work, yeah. Well, actually, it's a myth in many ways, to be fair, in my view, having done it myself. Um, I went and had a great career, short though it was, and as a designer in London. But there was quite a lot of mythology around that. There's a kind of self-perpetuated myth still that, you know, it's all down there. And, and there are, it's great to see people from London here tonight because there's this just kind of this worry that if you move out of London partway through your career somehow that's some sense of failure. Um, it's not actually the case. There's lots of good work up here in London. You know, it's not all in London. But I think there are, for me, two stages. One, immediately when they leave, make it easy for them to stay. And then three or four years in, make sure that they can start to access the network that people in London can access by helping them up to the next stage. There's obviously a, a problem in London for all young people in sort of finding affordable accommodations. It, could London's vice become a virtue for the North? Could London's vice be a virtue? Um, I don't know. I don't know quite how to answer that. It, it, is, it is a difficult place for them to be. Are you recognising people moving back, say, because they simply can't afford to live in London? Well, the, the cost of... I mean, it depends which part of the creative industries you're in, but, you know, if you're a, if you're a painter and you live in London, that's very difficult. If you're a painter and you live in Manchester, actually, there's quite a lot of mills which have been supported to convert themselves. I, I was at a couple last week with our delegation, where it's actually a quite affordable thing to do. There's, there's, quite a, there's a reasonably good network of people around. People do tend to know each other and support each other. And, and people actually like the regeneration team at the city council make opportunities available where they see them in the city centre for people to show that work. So there's a bit of an ecosystem that perhaps needs joining up a bit firmer. But I think it's at that stage, really, that we need to grab them and not let them drift off immediately. Sir Richard. Well, I, I can't try and deal with the uh, government bit, but I, I just uh, want to say a, a little bit more about what is happening in Manchester now. I, I, I talked about graduate staying, but uh, between the 2001-2011 census, Manchester was the fastest growing city uh, in, in the country. Uh, the biggest population growth sector was 25 to 29 year olds and our population of 25 to 29 year olds grew by 40% over that, uh, th that period of time. That, that seems to suggest uh, a lot of people uh, uh, are actually uh, are com both coming to the city and are staying within, within the city and that's probably matched by some work that Experian did, uh, an analysis based on a comparison between 2001 in 2011. I can't remember the exact phrase, uh, but it, it was uh, about the places with the most buzz 
in, in, in the UK, and Manchester came out as the place with the most buzz, with more buzz than any part of London or any other, or, 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 any other city uh, in, in the country. And uh, interesting, between 2001 and 2011, it had gone up from 20th place to first, uh, f first place. So I think actually a lot of the things that create a place where young people with careers want to be are already being done in Manchester. And the, if you want one more bit of evidence, uh, that if you're looking for a flat uh, in, in any, anywhere near Manchester city centre uh, today, you probably have to take it without seeing it because it will have gone by the time you get to uh, uh, seeing it. So we, we, in fact, we, we desperately need more accommodation uh, within the city because of the level of popularity. And that, that, that's true. At the moment, people are renting without even seeing because if they wait to see, they'll get gazumped on. And are you planning property. more affordable housing? Uh, we are planning more housing of uh, every sort. And I guess it's what does, uh, what does uh, government have to do, whether it's local government or national government. We've already talked about uh, skills. Uh, we need to uh, address housing. Uh, transport and digital connectivity are, are things that I think the, 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 the uh, public sector has a, a role to play. Uh, certainly, uh, workspace and the availability of a choice of affordable workspace uh, f for a whole range of different things is something that we have to uh, address. Again, and it's short project already been mentioned is a very good uh, example of that, but there are other examples. Islington Mill is a good a example. Uh, what the co-op are doing with Federation House, I think, is a, a good... There are a number of good, very good examples uh, around. But I, th I think ultimately for uh, creative industries, uh, what Manchester has to be able to demonstrate are it's a good lifestyle choice. It's where people want to be and want to live because we are talking about people who have choices. Uh, and I think we can demonstrate, uh, perhaps uh, difficult to do objectively, and um, with all due respect to Sheffield, which I love dearly, it's a fantastic northern city, but <coughs> you cannot get a better lifestyle anywhere in the country than Manchester. I'm glad to see competition is, is re competition has returned. Obviously, uh, Caroline. Um, I think the the if, if you're looking to retain <coughs> talent and um, you uh, and we're looking at new and emerging talent and people coming out of university uh, or you know from off apprenticeship schemes and so on. What what I, I think it's very difficult to constrain people. I think actually. Um, Again, you want people who've got lots of life experiences and have worked in lots of different places and, and so they can travel around and then they bring that experience back to, back to the city wherever, that, you know, wherever it is that they decide to... Oh. Yeah, the rest are working. <laughs> yeah, the rest are working, it's just you, Caroline. <laughs> Have all the, I think all the microphones no, the, this one's popped. Well, this one has. Mine has. Okay. Yeah. So Just what me. I. <laughs> okay. What, yeah. what I was saying was that was the need to make sure that people have have a, have um, have access to to a number of different work ex, um, opportunities, so that when they graduate, they they can pick and choose in terms of where they might work, and that requires critical mass. And going back to the conversation that we had perhaps at the beginning about building uh, or, or, the, or I suppose it's been referenced you know the greater north one of the advantages of of, um, of more devolution one of the um, advantages of having more decision making made locally around building infrastructure and so on means that it allows it allows those people um, uh, in charge of planning, for example, to to be more interventionist in terms of actually facilitating that critical mass, um, and I think that you know it, it's if you have that, and then you have a whole series of opportunities, such as, for example, the Sharp Project, which is offering affordable workspace and so on. All of those things then um, facilitate uh, the the ability of of people to to um, you know to earn a crust. Uh, 
Lou? Uh, so I, I, I will at some point come back to the narrative question because I think this is relevant to it as well because that's part of attracting. But I guess I'll answer it from an industry perspective, which is, in my experience, people... Very talented people largely just want great opportunities to work on great things, you know. So, so it's a fairly simple equation that if you, if what you make is going to be seen by millions of people, or it's going to win awards, or it's going to um, win accolades, or you're going to get the opportunity to work with other very talented people, then that's what attracts more talent. So, so there's that. So critical mass is part of that, you know. So um, it's it's much easier to persuade people to move their family and to move their life to a location if it feels like they could hop between jobs for the next 20 years because there are several employers in the region that all would give them a world-class opportunity. Yeah, so, so that joined up narrative is, is incredibly important because, and, and a joined up infrastructure that means it's a 10 minute hop, not a two hour hop, you know, it, it is also important. But I think some of this, you know, I would say this because I'm a brand person, but, but some of this also comes down to brand. You know, so, so uh, I think the, the idea of turning up on people's doorsteps, you know, we've got somebody from Sheffield, Designers Republic is probably one of the greatest examples we have of that, of, you know, a body of work and a set of people who were in their own right a reason to turn up, to move to Sheffield, to locate there and, and had an incredibly strong narrative in their own right. So I think, I think um, you know, it's about output. Why would you get on a plane and move to Silicon Valley? Because it has a reputation. You would imagine that you're going to, you know, the streets are paved with gold. You're going to have all this opportunity. I think, um, I will return to the narrative thing because it is relevant. I think it's a slightly archaic view to imagine that the narrative has to be driven top down because most of the places that we respect didn't have a top down strategy. Actually, the narrative just came out of great output. So, somewhere, what the city needs to keep on doing. How long can you wait for that? Well, I, you have to make things happen, don't you? So you have to... You know, we've got lots of component parts. They could probably be a bit more joined up, like the cities can be a bit more joined up, and I think that's where uh, the top-down bit can come in. But actually, what you just need is more and more of these things sprouting up. You know, the reputation um, of, you know, places like the Valley came out of an Instagram and then a Flipboard and then a Google and then... You know, so you just need great output. And if you have great places to work talent does get drawn at like a, you know, in a magnetic field to that place. So I think um, it, there's only so much you can strategize about there's, it. There's one other fact about Silicon Valley, though, that, go, and that goes with this, which is about investment. And Silicon Valley would never have happened without the American defense industry and uh, Stanford yeah. University. Without that money, it would never have happened. I think unlocking, sorry, just to add to that, I think um, unlocking regional capital, I think, is incredibly important. Um, because if, if, you, if you provide facilities, we've got, we're talking about, you know, better transportation, better work spaces, affordable housing and so on. One of the other reasons that businesses congregate in places like London or New York is because it's near access to capital. And, and actually addressing that, addressing how one does that, so that there is a, there is a, there is much more of a of a local approach to that. Um, and for goodness sake, actually Manchester itself particularly has got has does have that um, a, a strategy that 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 supports that investment into, for example, the creative industries. Um, also, I think adds a, adds a you know a really really important element. Okay, there are lots of keen people, keen to ask questions. Uh, first, I think, the, the, what, did you still want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's Belinda Peach from Peachy, and I'm on the board of the MPA. Um, I think we do have talent in certain areas, and we are already attracting, I mean, our television industry here, hence um, Media City and, and the build there. Um, our drama production is um, bar none here. We're, we're, so we are attracting, I think, in certain areas. It isn't all about digital, but what we do share across the whole converged industry, which we are now, now heading very fastly towards, is the skills issue. And the skills issue at new entrants, I'm sort of digressing, but I think we do have an awful lot to shout about. And in a way, we do have a narrative, we just don't know what it is. The fact that we've got somebody here from London that's come to find out why, what's going on, says that we are doing it, but we, maybe it's not written down. It's, so, a de it's a detective story. Yeah, to be no, we know what it is, we're just not telling anyone, okay. that's how it is. <laughs> Can we have the mic here, please? Hello, um, my name is Naomi Turner, and I run the All-Party Parliamentary Design Innovation Group. Um, so thanks very much 
to Design Manchester for allowing us to support this event. I have a very quick point on skills. Um, I mean, we talk about the digital economy as unlocking growth, as you know, making all this money, um, you know, the, the powerhouse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we haven't talked about engineering, about traditional kind of industrial skills. I mean, the, the future of the digital economy is not in an app. The future of the digital economy is in connected cities, connected products. Um, really thinking about quite profoundly how we can live better lives. So I think that's what's missing from the skills debate so far this evening, but it's obviously a bigger debate. Um, the, my question is that, um, obviously my remit is parliamentary. Um, I'm also from Merseyside, so I'm biased. We're all showing our cards tonight. <laughs> But um, obviously there's a lot going on in the sort of devolution space. The Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, has just announced Tech North, which gives all of two million to, um, to a Tech North hub in Sheffield, which would buy you maybe a four-bedroom house in North London. Let's, let's face it. It's, it's a contemptuous amount of money. Um, similarly, Innovate UK, formerly the Technology Strategy Board, are kind of talking about clustering, but they're sort of saying, oh, we'll, we'll sort of put some money towards Sunderland, we'll maybe put some money towards Middlesbrough, there's a massive disconnection at the national level. So I'm really interested in kind of, obviously the message that I should take back to the parliamentarians that I speak to. Um, that, you know, should, should we pursue this joined up strategy or should we let cities get on with it? You're saying there's not enough money? I'm saying, that, I'm saying that it's all talk, not enough cash. So and Richard, do you want to no. respond to that? Well, uh, I, I wish the uh, two million pounds was for a Tech North hub in uh, at Sheffield. It's actually for a collection of hubs across the whole of the. Yes, yeah, uh, sorry, the, the you're, North you're quite right. It's yeah. not. It's not even that good. Uh, uh, yeah. In terms <laughs> of the amount, uh, amount, uh, amount of uh, money. Uh, I, th I think there are there are there are two things here that uh, uh, the UK government has traditionally underinvested outside London and South East. And again, this is not a, a versus London mm -hmm. argument. This is about the need for more investment in other places rather than less. In investment uh, there. So uh, I think, for example, the argument for Crossrail 2 uh, is a very, very st uh, strong argument, but it, it is no stronger than the argument for improved uh, uh, rail links across the north of England. And uh, a progressive country would do both, not have silly arguments about which one it's, uh, which one it's going to do. So I think that, that there ought to be more uh, central government investment <coughs> in places like Manchester, Leeds, uh, Sheffield, but in the things that underpin uh, economic uh, growth, because it, it's not a su substitute for mm -hmm. private sector-led uh, led growth, and that's where it really needs to uh, uh, come from. And what that implies is it's something I said earlier, uh, that the cities of the north have to have far more control over their own uh, destiny, so far more of that investment uh, whether it's investment in companies or whether it's investment in infrastructure or whatever has to be generated and controlled within the north rather than as being dependent on uh, a very re actually even if you're in London the uh, Whitehall is very remote never mind whether you're in, uh, uh, in, in Manchester and we should no not be dependent on a very remote uh, mm. Parliament and White Whitehall we need to have far greater control over our own resources, our own, own, own investment. And that's clear, an objective for Manchester as a city, and probably shared across northern cities, uh, that we eliminate our fiscal deficit completely, so we generate enough tax revenue in Manchester to fund everything we want to do uh, in, in, in Manchester, and that we build up our own investment pool, so that instead of having to go to uh, uh, Nick Clegg or uh, whoever, say can we have a few quid uh, please is that, that we will have those funds in Manchester to make decisions ourselves about what we uh, How, how close are you in. to doing that to eliminating um, a fiscal deficit? Oh a long way off. We, we, we've, got, we've just got about four billion pounds to go and when we get there we'll, we'll, we'll be okay but uh, we're not going to do that unless we have greater control over the, the resource that's already been, uh, sure. be, been spent. So we, we've got a long way to go there but we are starting to build up our own investment uh, pools. We've taken what it has been central government money, regional growth fund, we've taken European uh, money, we've taken some locally generated money, uh, some private sector money and we're, we're building up recyclable funds. So it, when we invest, instead of it being in the old style of, of grants, which is just sort of given away, it's now nearly always loan or equity investment. Uh, which I think is likely to produce stronger uh, businesses anyway, but also a, a chunk of that comes back 
for us to be able to reinvest uh, as well. And a very odd argument for uh, predominantly Labour councils with a Tory government uh, over the first round of regional growth fund, whereas we wanted to invest it and they wanted to give it away. Um, figure that one out. Uh, we're going to we're gonna have to move on. Um, uh, next question is from Sally Johnson, who's the Chief Executive of Screen Yorkshire. Where's Sally, please? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm from the other side of the Pennines, but definitely uh, in the north. And before I ask my question, I just want to make a couple of observations. Um, this debate is about the north and the north as a whole. And many of the issues that we've raised here tonight, particularly about disconnectedness, uh, we've been having exactly the same conversations in Leeds, and I suspect the same conversations in Sheffield. So they're by no means uh, Manchester only uh, issues. We have in the north of England the two biggest creative and digital industry clusters outside of London, Leeds and Manchester. That is a pretty good starting point. And if that's the case, why are we still having debates about our inability to attract and retain talent? This debate is really important, but actually you can get drawn down the route of trying to uh, you know, work out all the individual problems that we have to deal with. The most sensible thing that we could actually start doing now is telling the story better. We have a fantastic starting point, but my God, we are really rubbish at telling the story about what the North has to offer. So, my question is, putting the rail links aside, which will take years to build, and I have been on a train between Hull and Manchester this evening, God. What? Thank you. Um, well, did you start yesterday? Uh, no, but actually it was quite good. It wasn't bad, apart from the fact that there were only three carriages when there should have been six. So it was a bit like the tube on a particularly bad night. However, um, my question is, putting the rail links aside, what can we do across the whole of the north to encourage better connectedness and better collaboration? Thank you. Caroline? So, um, I, so a, a couple of weeks ago, I flew to um, Dusseldorf um, for a meeting in Essen. And, um, and then whilst I was there, I also had another meeting in Dortmund. But that whole part of Germany talks about itself as the Ruhr. I had no idea what the Ruhr was. I still think the Ruhr is probably Dusseldorf. Um, uh, but but there the, but there but there is a, there is a, a sense that it is a thing. It, it, I don't know that it's necessarily got a, a story what the roar is, but it absolutely plans together and they talk together, and they have co-investment funds together, um, and they have a uh, probably lots and lots of probably not particularly interesting meetings about what they're going to be doing together. But there is a sense that um, it's fine to talk about, this is probably going to be very contentious and I'm going to get shot by people who don't live in Manchester. But um, I think it's fine because the, in terms of the fact that I went thinking I was going to Dusseldorf. Um, and I think that one of the problems about these sorts of debates is it's, all, it's, it's very inward looking. So it's all very much about competition between, not necessarily competition, but a discussion about the various cities, rather than thinking about who the audience is. And it seems to me that the audience is an international audience. Um, and that international audience probably barely knows where, well, it probably knows where London is, but it, and it may know where <coughs> Manchester is. It certainly probably doesn't know where Bristol or Birmingham is. Um, and I think that there needs to be some sort of shorthand, if you like, that's very identifiable. And it, sounds, it seems to me that Manchester probably is that shorthand. So I think that... I would have thought that Liverpool and Manchester are known all around the world. Football, uh, music, Well, yes, I suppose Liverpool, yes, yes. But I, don't, but I think, I think what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that um, people do remember cities. They don't, you know, talking about the north is that's, that's a British conversation. That's not an international conversation. Fine. Uh, David? Um, difficult one, isn't it? What, what, can we, what was the question? What can we do for collaboration outside of the rail networks? What well, can we do to encourage connections and, and collaborations? Connections. Yeah. I, I, you know, obviously, as an HEI, as a higher education institution, there's enormous competition across the north of England like there is everywhere else in England. We compete with Leeds and Sheffield and Liverpool for students, um, for, for the incoming talent. 
Um, but I think where we, one area where we probably could do more is around research, actually. I think there's probably a research offer that could be across the north of England that could play on the strengths from each of the HEIs across that region, and perhaps with partners too, we've mentioned some possible industrial partners tonight, that could be an offer where you're bringing somebody in either to Leeds or to Manchester, but you're, you're actually working right across the northwest. You're drawing in PhD students or, or expertise or very particular people who deal with graphene or whatever it might be who are in one particular city but can connect up with a research agenda right across the north of England. So perhaps, for me, that's where I would look. I'd look for research collaboration with industrial partners and HEIs across the north. Luke? Uh, so, well, I, I, this is the creative industry, isn't it? So I suppose we, we only work to a deadline, and I guess uh, what's different about the debate, even though we've all been in these debates for a long time, is there is a political window. You know, and there seems to be an interesting kind of appetite in this window, hence Tech North last week. And I think what was it? I mean, I was at the Tech North uh, launch, and there were lots of cities. We were in Sheffield. There were lots of cities represented, and... There was no spirit of infighting, I don't think. There was a genuine spirit of, okay, so the cheque on the table at the moment is only two million quid. But, but well, only, you know, we'll take two million quid. But, um, but, what, but there's a dialogue now. So, and, and I guess what was critical about that was the opener from, from Clegg, which was around a public acceptance that for too long the debate has been about a London-centric country and a country that is focused on one sector which is the financial sector so I think the the financial pain of the last few years has taught the country that we can't be dependent um, on the financial services forever and actually the rise of you know the creative and digital sectors and tech as a sector is, is incredibly important so so I think um, yeah, I, I think the, the best thing we can do is kind of hold hands across the divide, and if there is any divide, let's make the most of this little window, where there is, not just in tech, you know, we, we've got a conversation going around, there's opportunities around film, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities to create a coherent narrative, you know, however stuck together with sticky tape it might be for now, just to get through the, through the deadline and make the most of whether they mean it or they don't mean it, they've got to be seen to mean it, you know, and so let's use the opportunity to drive through as much change as we can and drive through as much opportunity as we can. So, um, yeah, I, I think, right. yeah, it's conversation and, and an opportunity, isn't it, that we're not going to do if we don't talk to each other. So, Richard, do you mind if I miss you out on this one? I'd like to sneak in one final question, um, and I'll turn to you first on this. Um, Laura Harper from Shoesmiths. Uh, good evening. The government claims to be in favour of empowering the cities, um, but against um, devolving tax powers. What kind of devolution is necessary to achieve a thriving and creative economy in the north? Uh, Sir Richard. Uh, okay. Uh, there, there are two sides or two parts to devolution. One is fiscal devolution, tax raising uh, powers. Uh, the other is the, the straightforward devolution of. Uh, power and uh, re resources. Uh, I, I think ultimately we need both, but uh, fiscal devolution, tax raising powers is slow and complicated. Uh, if the Secretary of State for uh, Business uh, wanted to devolve uh, skills powers in the way I've described earlier, it could do it tomorrow. Uh, just, just like that, because uh, the power, ex power exists. So uh, I, I think, first of all, we need, we need to concentrate on uh, those powers and resources that can be quickly devolved and then work through to those things that are either more complicated or require uh, uh, le legislation. But uh, I can tell you what we're talking to uh, government uh, about, which is, uh, which is about that the whole of the £22 billion pounds that is spent in Greater Manchester gets controlled in uh, Greater Manchester. So that's uh, our, our starting, uh, starting point, but we are talking about skills budget. We are talking about uh, the, the evolution of structural unemployment programmes like the work programme, uh, commissioning of integrated health and uh, uh, social care in order to be able to support complex de uh, dependency and so on. Uh, business support, all being, including international uh, trade and investment, all being run out of uh, Greater Man uh, Manchester. Uh, Re-regulation of uh, public uh, transport so that we can have properly integrated uh, pub public uh, uh, tr uh, transport. Uh, uh, those are, I guess, the, the things that are first on the uh, on the agenda in terms of a devolution uh, uh, package. And I, I think we do have a window where 
there is a re reasonable grounds to believe that we are going to make very, very significant uh, progress on all of those things very, very, uh, very, very quickly. Will it matter uh, who wins the election? Uh, well, uh, so, well, uh, but in that, in that at, sense, at, at, the, at the moment, or, uh, all of the all of the existing major parties are first of all claiming to support devolutionary uh, policies, and they're all sp uh, claiming to want to support. Uh, uh, greater independence of the North with, with, within this. So theoretically, it shouldn't make uh, uh, a lot of difference. But I have to say that if we have to wait till the general election uh, to, uh, to make a lot of progress on this, it won't meet my defi definition of uh, uh, what ought to be happening very, very quickly. But with it, within this, I, I, I'm a bit cheeky and throw something in that comes from uh, the last question. So I talked about uh, re-regulating bus services, about being able to have an in integrated transport network. There are probably two things that underpin a modern, only two things that underpin a modern economy. One's knowledge and the other is connect connectivity, and that's principally uh, uh, transport. So uh, in terms of the, the north of England, the northern cities working more closely together, and actually we, we do work very close, to, uh, close together uh, we meet on a very regular basis, and actually those meetings include Bristol, Birmingham, uh, Nottingham, Glasgow, and Cardiff as, uh, as, as, as well. So, uh, yeah. So, and um, we do work t together, but uh, unless we improve the transport links, and it doesn't all have to wait till 2030. We we can do some stuff. For example, uh, we've done electrification Manchester, Liverpool. We can do Manchester, Leeds. Some of that stuff can be done uh, relatively quickly. Unless we have that physically improved connectivity, it will limit our ability to uh, uh, collaborate. And that's why uh, we're seeking not only massive investment in transport in the, in the north, the northern cities together are seeking to control and run those railways as well. Caroline? Um, I think Sir Richard has sort of covered all of the ground, really, in terms of you know, the whole issue around devolution of, um, of, of powers and, and um, uh, tax raising powers and so on. I suppose I'd just like to, to raise the issue around things like regional banks and local banks mm -hmm. and what I was talking before about in terms of unlocking local and regional capital. I think um, I, I ha it's not all about the public sector um, being, em I mean, the public sector does need to be empowered to do more things closer to home, mm -hmm. but it's also about attracting um, a more vigorous private sector and it's about um, kick, not, you know, it's about putting, giving that private sector a bit more firepower. And I think the concentrate, you know, where money lives is really, really important. And you just need to bring more money closer to businesses up here. Um, I think it's for the creative industries. It's, it's um, uh, one one of the problems around raising money for creative businesses is that a lot of bankers, for example, private equity investors have no idea about those business models. They don't know what you're talking about. They don't have that exposure to them. Um, in London, you have very, very specialists, TM&T teams, who know something about those business models. In Manchester, well, you're, you're quite lucky in that, the, um, in that the, uh, both RBS and Lloyds have creative industry and digital relationship managers. Um, that you're, that's unlikely. You're unlikely to get that in Leeds or in Huddersfield or even in Liverpool. Um, so they don't employ. They don't employ people who know things about those t those types of businesses. Um, and I think that actually addressing that knowledge gap more locally, so that people, so that you know, the people who've got money know something about the businesses that are here, is is really really key in terms of um, in terms of growth. And and in, and in doing that, that will then work hand in hand with the sort of public sector conversation we've just been having. Great, David. Um, it's not much to add really, but perhaps two brief things. Maybe the devolution of more resource to the creative and cultural sector generally. If you look at the, um, I mentioned research before, if you look at the amount of money that goes to the Arts and Humanities Research Council compared to the amount of money that goes to the Science Council, they're pulls apart. So there's something to correct there. Um, and then when it gets out into the regions, I've got a little graph in front of me, which, which I'm trusting because it was the Guardian that published it, that shows me how much money, <laughs> how much money was, um, sorry, how much money was spent by, for example, the Arts Council in the regions, and how much money was spent in London by the Arts Council. Hugely different. So, um, a bit of pressure on um, on some of those national bodies to make sure the spend is equitable, and we get more of a level playing field across the country. Right. Luke, you can be brief. 
uh, m money and talent. I guess, you know, the echoing what Caroline and Richard have talked about, <coughs> you've got those two things in one concentrated place, and that's, that's and more control over it. That's got to start to get things moving in the right place. Great. Can I have some quick questions, please? Uh, <coughs> woman in red? Uh, second row, please. <laughs> so that's more Burgundy. Oh, Burgundy, sorry. Woman in Burgundy. <laughs> Hello, My thank fashion you. consultant. So I'm Jackie Carter and I'm from the University of Manchester. I've heard um, lots of really interesting um, points tonight, um, but most of them uh, are around sort of qualitative, what I call qualitative um, data. And I think one of the missing ingredients here is about making a really, really strong case based on quantitative data. So we have a mantra where I work, it's all about no stories without numbers, no numbers without stories. And I think the stories are sort of taking care of themselves and you're surfacing those. But there's something missing here. There's something about a compelling evidence base. And, and you talked about research and you've talked about um, the census changes. And if all of that is pulled together across the north, however one, you want to define it, you'll have a really compelling story to tell that's backed up by numbers that will then be taken seriously by policymakers and others. And so my contribution really is, you know, where is that data? Is, is it available? Let's open it up across the region. Let's, sh let's be transparent and sort of address government agendas. And let's show leadership in that area. And that's actually nothing to do with the creative industries. You could say that about anything. But my background is statistics, as you mm -hmm. probably guess. And all the stuff in um, the, the Guardian, the data blog and everything. There's a real story to tell here over and above just what everybody on the panel and in the audience has been saying. I think that might be the missing ingredient. So it, sorry, it's not a question, guys, it's just a point. Thank you. Presumably you guys have the data. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we have some data. We, the data. Data is all over the place. Uh, what I think we're very in fa favour of is, 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 is having open data. Uh, with open data, then there are lots of other people can come and play with it and do, do stuff that we would probably never, never, never think of. And uh, we have been doing that on a regular basis to try and make all the data we have available for people to use. Can we oh, have Oxford? Sorry, sorry there, is, there, is, there is quite a bit of research actually. So, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports recently published not just the national statistics around the value of creative industries, which is something like just under £72 billion a year in terms of value, creates £8 million an hour, etc., but it also started to um, publish regional statistics around the size and the scale of the, of the sector. Now, it's the first time it's actually I think it was, it was only about three or four months ago that they released that data. Um, I happen to have some of those figures here, but I won't, we don't necessarily go into them. But, um, but I do think that is, that, that is happening. Um, I, think it's, I think one of the problems is, is that it's, it's only very recently that there was any sort of measurement around the creative industries nationally, actually, that there was any sense that, that the creative industries were one voice. And one of the things that the Creative Industries Council has done has been able to talk not about the game sector or the film sector or this sector or the music sector or whatever, but the creative industries as a whole. And I think getting that right centrally actually has been incredibly important. So now the ONS, the Offices of National Statistics, have got something to work down from. And I think, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of, lots of studies, Booz and Co, Oxford Econometrics, etc. But actually having a benchmark that is, uh, that is owned by the government <laughs> centrally work and, and being able to use that has an awful lot more weight to it, actually, than locally commissioned surveys and so on. Can we have one last question, please? Mm -hmm. uh, the woman four rows back on the end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Sorrel Hirschberg. I'm from London, um, specifically Hackney in East London. Um, make no apologies for that. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's been a really, really interesting debate. I've got one question um, which does relate to the work that I do. Um, the Sorrel Foundation works with children and young people all over the country. Um, there's been a lot of interesting um, discussion tonight about how you can attract students, how you can attract graduates and how you can attract investment. Do you think it's as important to make a kind of investment and commitment to incubate young people's talent and to nurture that talent and that aspiration when they're much younger? Who would like to pick that? I'll pick that. I'll start it anyway. Absolutely is the answer to that. Of course it is. And it's one of the things that worries art schools right across the country, that our pipeline is going to dry up. 
because arts education isn't taken seriously in schools because it's made easy not to. So it's, that's a big agenda item, actually. I, I, I think that's a real, a real truism. Um, the other thing that I think is worth kind of just noting, it, and I, I don't know quite, maybe it's something we work together with industrial partners on, but since, we, since the fee regime came into higher education, one of, the, one of the results of that, certainly in this art school, and I'm pretty sure it's across the country, is that students, potential students got more, they played safe. So they go for traditional sounding titles. So, and, and we've heard tonight about the skills debate. So you make an offer that's, that's about what's current in the industry, and an 18-year-old tends not to go for it. They'll go for something very traditional. They're very risk averse because they're investing a lot of money. So we need to get right down into the schools and explain to them why that actually there's a massive employment opportunity here and you need to recognise that and don't play safe when you, when you make that application into your university. Uh, sadly, that has to be the end. I'm sorry. Um, could you please thank our panel, uh, Sir Richard Lees, Luke Cordwell, Caroline Norbury and David Crow. No, no, no. I'm being, I'm being put in the driving.